Welcome to WonderPod. WonderPod is the official podcast of Wonderfest, Ireland's first online children's book festival. I'm your host, Connor Brayden. In this podcast, we'll be discussing everything there is to talk about with children's books. I'll be talking with Ireland's top writers, illustrators, publishers, agents, and more. You can find out more about Wonderfest by heading to wonderfest.ie. Now, on with the show. Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to episode two of WonderPod. This week's episode features three amazing creators of picture books. We have Paddy Donnelly, Una Woods, and Tarsilla Cruz. Before I go on to talk, introduce our um, brilliant picture book creating guests, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone who downloaded, rated, reviewed, and talked about episode one. It's great to see such a positive engagement with the show already, and that's only one episode, so I can't wait for you all to hear the next eight. It's going to be great. Eight, great. Look what I did. I'm rhyming. Anyway, so we have Paddy Donnelly. Paddy is an Irish illustrator and author based in Belgium. He works in quite a textured and painterly approach with a fondness for illustrating the sea and animals. He has four picture books publishing in 2021. That is right, four picture books publishing this year where most people can't even get one. So well done there, Paddy. Um, his l- latest one as well is his debut author illustrated picture book, The Vanishing Lake. Fun fact about Paddy, he wishes Pluto was still a planet, and Paddy, I'd say Pluto does too. Una Woods is an author and illustrator who lives in Dublin. She loves to create fun, spooky stories and illustrates them using bright colours, simple shapes, and lots of patterns. Her first picture book, Have You Seen the Dublin Vampire, was published last year and won much critical acclaim. Her latest picture book is called A Spooktacular Place to Be. Tarsila Cruz is a self-taught artist born in Brazil and Irish at heart with a love of languages, books and stationery. To be honest, I don't think there's anyone who writes or illustrates that doesn't love and visit the L stationery section of any shop. Uh, Tarsila lives in a house with a bright yellow door in the heart of Dublin City with her husband, son and two happy dogs, Pixel and Tag. Tarsila illustrates a lot with Futa Fata and O'Brien Press in particular, with her latest book being called My Little Album of Ireland. If this episode is of particular interest to you, you really should check out um, some of the events happening with Wonderfest. So we have a masterclass on illustrating children's books that is hosted by Margaret Ann Suggs. We also have another masterclass on writing and illustrating picture books with Mary Murphy. And finally, there's a webinar. So the webinar is going to be hosted by um, children's illustrator Margaret Ann Suggs and featuring other illustrators like Ashwin Chaco, Emma Byrne and Tarsilla Cruz from this very episode. So if you didn't get enough of Tarsilla here, you'll get more than enough in the webinar. (laughs) Um, But for now, that's enough from me. Let's hear from our expert picture book creators, shall we? Hello, Pally and Tarsilla and Una. Thank you so much for coming on to WonderPod. How are you all doing? Great. Doing great. Thanks Good. for having us. Not at all. Not at all. Um, this is the very, this is, this is really weird because this is the second episode that the listeners will get to grab onto, but this is the second last one for me to record. So I feel like I'm kind of time traveling a little bit. <laughs> Doing a Tarantino. Just all over the place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just have it all out of order and keep people on their toes. So we're talking picture books today, which um, I know I'm certain a lot of people are really looking forward to because I think when people talk about, I'd love to be a children's author, I feel like the vast majority think picture books first because they think it's easy because they're short. And then they try and write it and realize, no, it's actually difficult in a completely different way to how writing a longer book would be. So I'm looking forward to getting to hear all your thoughts on picture books. So um, uh, Tarsila, maybe we'll, we'll start with yourself. Could you give us a really quick snippet of how you got started in children's books? Okay, so I got started, uh, well, my love for children's books been since I was a little kid. My dad is absolutely crazy about books, so I've, I've grown up with, like, so many books around the house. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil, so, you know, um, a few different perspectives on books and uh, different culture as well, so I think that uh, was interesting, but the love of books has always been there, and the way that I got started was when, when I was pregnant, I decided to to send in a few uh, 
um, a few of my illustrations around. I was already interested in, in uh, children's books. I took a course with Adrian Gagan a few um, couple of years before, and I decided to approach a few publishers. So I sent in uh, postcards around. And six months after my son was born, I got a reply with a proposal uh, for a book. But um, so that's kind of how I got started. And I had a smaller uh, illustration jobs in between. Um, but they were really, really small. It was like for advertising and things like that. But then that was the break that I got. And it was with a small uh, Irish language publisher in the West, um, Futafata, uh, which we all happen to have books with. Uh, and, um, oh, yeah. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was the, my first book. And um, I happened to make that book while I was breastfeeding in the middle of the night and it was it was an amazing amazing journey it was uh, Nagara Skull and it was Myra Zeff who wrote the book and from then on it just didn't stop <laughs> um that's that's very impressive multitasking I will say uh, <laughs> like I I can I can I feel like I can barely draw with all my attention so that's well done <laughs> uh look I I don't know how I did it I really don't. I don't remember much of that time. I'd say any mother would be feel the same. <laughs> um, so, Paddy, what about you? How did you how did you get started in his books? Uh, so, so my background's uh, not in illustration. Um, I studied web design and, and graphic design um, at, at university, and then I, I worked as a a web and app designer for a number of years, um, designing iPhone apps and um, and things like that. And and over the years, I started to, I wanted to get into illustration a little bit, and I, I illustrated um, a few kids apps um, for the iPad, iPhone, and I did some editorial illustration as well. And then I went, um, I took six months off, and we went traveling around New Zealand, Australia, and everything. Um, so I didn't work for all that time. Uh, and while I was away, I was trying to think, this was in 2017, uh, uh, we, I, I started to think kind of what I wanted to do. Did I want to go back and keep doing apps and web design? I was kind of falling out of love a little, little bit with them, um, with that after doing it for so many years. Um, and I wanted to do more illustration stuff and I really liked doing the kids apps. So, um, and I mean, I always, I, I really loved, um, picture books as a kid and thought it would be an interesting, um, yeah, industry to get into. And I, I wanted to try it out and see if I, uh, see how it would go. And when I came back from my trip then in, um, in the summer of 2017, I started to look into just kind of, uh, I just immersed myself in, in, uh, in that world and bought tons of picture books. And I, I tried to research as much and read, read, uh, you know, illustrators blogs and, um, I tried to just figure out how the whole industry worked and, and, uh, you know, how do you get published and, um, how it all, you know, how all the different parts fit together and looking at different styles and just, you know, tried to uh, immerse myself as much as possible. And then I went to the Frankfurt book fair. So, so I'm over in Belgium and, um, it's so really Frankfurt, big, isn't it? the Frankfurt book yeah, fair. It's, it's, so it's massive. Yeah. It, it's crazy big. And, um, and it's not too far away. It's like, three or four hours away in the car so so I went to it just to kind of um yeah see what was out there and see all the different publishers and what they were doing and, and just kind of really see what the industry was about and I found um uh, the more I read and the more I I um looked into the industry I found for a, an illustrator um it was really tough to get your foot in the door with a publisher if you didn't have an agent um, it's not impossible, but having an agent uh, kind of, yeah, really helps you. Uh, they have all the connections already and publishers, I guess, see it as a kind of vetting process that, yeah. that you know, if you have an agent, you're already, you know, at a, a, a certain level. Um, uh, and so they will work with a lot of agents who they've worked with before and, and who can recommend certain artists and everything. So there seemed to be, that seemed to be a really... Um, uh yeah good option or a needed um a thing that I, I i thought i would i would try and pursue so i um yeah i i submitted my work at the same time i was also um 
you know, just adding a bunch of things into my portfolio that I thought were, um, yeah, that publishers would like to see. Yeah. Um, so I tried to broaden my portfolio a bit after being at Frankfurt um, and doing a lot of portfolio reviews with publishers, um, which was, I had just a mix of everything in there. So I got some uh, feedback that, that it totally wasn't right for picture books or, or that I had too many styles and, and like lots of different feedback. So I learned a lot from that and I tried to build up my portfolio and then I got my agent in um, at the, at the end of that year. So uh, I think um, maybe January, 2018, I signed with them and they started getting me um, picture book work. And then it's just gotten busier and busier and busier um since then and we um that's what you really... want though right <laughs> yeah yeah um I, I, it's been great yeah it's just um it's it's been really great having an agent that that um can guide you a little bit and tell you what to put in your portfolio and to help shape your career a little bit and they have all the connections and they can give you advice on you know which projects to to take on or what um you know, what would, you know, kind of build you as a somebody as a, in your corner that has your best interests at heart really. And yeah, uh, for, for the listeners, if agents is something you're into, that will be an episode. This is so weird. It will be an episode for you, but it has been an episode for me, but uh, <laughs> it's coming up and it's a really good one. Um, yeah. So that's great. Thank you so much, Patty. And um, Una, uh, so were you an app developer who decided to go into illustration or were you a mom breastfeeding and illustrating the middle of the night? Oh, I, or do you have a completely different one? <laughs> totally different one. I actually trained as a classical animator and I worked in oh. animation for quite a few years. I worked in quite a few feature films. And then I kind of realized that's not really what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to draw my own things and do my own stories. And I kind of really loved kind of looking at picture books and illustration so I kind of got started off by getting jobs as a freelance illustrator and I worked on loads of different kind of children's illustrations but not picture books I worked for lots of educational books websites games kind of stickers like loads of really fun stuff so I kind of built up a portfolio and that enabled me to join Illustrators Ireland and through that I kind of got to meet loads of um, illustrators who had done picture books so I learned loads from those so I um, started kind of making my own little kind of dummy books and creating my own kind of characters and then in 2018 um, O'Brien Press ran kind of a pitch event where you could go along and pitch your idea for a picture book so that's where I pitched my idea for Have You Seen the Dublin Vampire? And that's where it all began. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and when I heard that straight, it was like, oh, pitch events when we could do things in person. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was actually brilliant getting to meet like a publisher and showing them the work in person. It was amazing. I think I think that's one thing I think a lot of um, people looking to get into this uh, career and this lifestyle is that those little events are so hard to find out about so um how, how did you find out about that particular thing you know was it was a part of culture night by any chance part of culture night and i saw it on social media and i when i saw it originally i thought oh i'd never really feel confident enough to do it and then a friend of mine persuaded me to do it so i'm so glad i did <laughs> yeah because i think that's one thing is you need to do the basics of follow a couple of the smaller publishers, the mid-sized, the big ones, just so you get an idea of what's what's going on and you'll get to see things like, because uh, I think O'Brien's press, they do that every culture night, well, that. most culture nights. Yeah, they do that every culture night. Yeah. Now, what can be interesting as well is if you if you uh, get associated with, like if you develop a portfolio and you apply and you become part of an association like Illustrators Ireland, or if you join the AOI, which is the Association of Illustrators, or other uh, um, groups and associations like that, usually they will advertise events like that, so that you could potentially meet uh, clients or at least present your, your work or even have portfolio reviews. So all of those are uh, well advertised and promoted within those means. So like what Paddy was saying, once you become part of trying to figure out how the industry works and find the people who are involved. So say if you get in, if you become a member of Children's Books Ireland, which is a charity that wants to make every child a reader in Ireland, 
they are always promoting events, not only for people who want, who are interested in children's books, maybe teachers, librarians, parents, but also people who want to grow and develop it within the industry. So lots of those associations can be very helpful as well to find out about events like that. Thank you so much for that, Teresa, because that's that's news to me. <laughs> you know, like, and that, that's the thing. It's such a complex industry. Like, there's so many cogs in the machine. It's it's kind of sometimes a bit hard to keep track. <laughs> yeah, and it can take it can take a really long time to really mm-hmm. figure it all out, and also get enough work in your portfolio and make enough connections and figure out which publisher does which and find out about all these events and sometimes it's you know once a year events so I mean there's a really big you know from the first kind of if you're thinking about getting into picture books and thinking about I would like to try that out as a career I think um, I I probably uh, it probably took me a year ish from like the first kind of thinking about it okay, I think um, I might try out something in that. And then after uh, maybe six months later, then I started really doing some stuff that, that I, and putting some stuff in, into my portfolio and lots of stuff which was really wrong um, to put in my portfolio. But you have to figure all of that out and also do the, you know, if it's, if it's illustrating you're doing, you have to illustrate a bunch of stuff before the stuff really starts to look good and, and, and that it could fit in a picture book. Mm. And and then, you know, it was months and months after that before, I, and I submitted my stuff to a bunch of different agents um, and got rejected and then eventually got my, um, my agent. And um, the it can take a long while for an agent to, you know, they do uh, reviews and that can take a few months and everything. And then after that, there's a lot of waiting. I mean, that's if you go with, for the agent route, but I mean, if you if you don't and you're submitting stuff to publishers, there's a lot of waiting around there and it might, there's a lot of rejection in, in publishing as well. So there's a lot of waiting uh, before, um, you know, from first having that idea to figuring it all out and getting enough work out there and then getting, uh, uh, getting a book deal and, and, and a project and creating that book. And then, so the, the, that's something that I definitely didn't uh, understand, um, because I came from the tech world, which is like, Where it's you, you just instantly, <laughs> yeah, you instantly just get the beta version of something out there and somebody's using it and you yeah. get feedback and it, that's instant. Whereas this is, you know, you're just waiting forever. And in the beginning, also in the first years, you're telling people that you're working on books, but it's, you have nothing to show for a <laughs> year or two. So nobody really, you know, can see anything. So it really takes a while before, um, you know things get moving so there's a lot of a lot of time involved yeah. a lot of patience involved for sure Tarsila and Una the two of you have been smiling and nodding along all the time Paddy was saying that so I feel like I don't need to ask is that what you felt too it is it is something that's kind of common in the traditional publishing publishing sphere that it, it does take its time but it, it is worth it in the end as well you know um Una, I want, I want to ask you this question first. Um, I'm going to sound really stupid asking this, but <laughs> what exactly, in your opinion, is a picture book? So like, and by that, I mean, at what point is it a picture book versus a, a book with illustrations, if you know what I mean? Well, I think a picture book is a book that really tells the story through the illustrations, whether there's only like a few words or there's no words because... I think if the, the pictures really have to tell the story because a lot of kids that have picture books, maybe they can't read. They're kind of too young. So they, they love kind of looking at the, the pictures. So I suppose that's what I think a picture book is. Perfect. I, I think, like I said, it is a bit stupid, but I think that's the thing, isn't it? Like in a picture book, the pictures are kind of usually the, 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 the main star. Like it's, it's, that's the thing you buy it for to look at the art and then hopefully the story is really nice as well whereas other books the text is telling the story and the illustrations are there to boost the text really i think that the best picture books are definitely ones where the the pictures and the words kind of blend together and it's they're both telling the one story and the the best ones uh yeah, if you removed one of the elements, they wouldn't work. So they wouldn't work with just the text. You couldn't, you know, visualize 
um, what was happening, you, you would have to see it. And similarly, you know, if you um, uh, removed the, 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 the text, you know, the images wouldn't, wouldn't say enough um, uh, on their own. So I think that that's when really good picture books, I think uh, they, they blend together really nicely and you have this, um, this partnership uh, when you read that book. But of course you do have wordless picture books as well. And you have like, there's a whole range of things from yeah. board, board books for, for really young kids. And then you kind of move into uh, books, you know, kind of where there are illustrations in it, but I mean, it's not full on illustrations all, all the way, um, which, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's also kind of picture books are kind of viewed as a, a stepping stone to, to kids kind of getting introduced to reading and, um, and the pictures are drawing them in and then they're kind of, uh, progressing on to books without pictures but that's uh, uh, you know I still really enjoy picture books a lot and I don't think it's yeah. kind of I don't think it should be viewed like that that you kind of the pictures go away yeah. and, and yeah. you know it just becomes uh, text but they certainly do have a really great place in a child's life um, kind of introducing them to stories and kind of opening imaginations and um, and and you know yeah also introducing them to to reading as well. Um, well, pic picture books are like, um, I, I really like the way that you were talking about um, the, like this dance between the text and the images because um, I have a lot of work that I've done with writers, so I'm mainly an illustrator. I am working on a couple of books that I've written on my own, but I do a lot of this sort of dance with, um, with my authors, you know, we're we're both co-authors of the story when we're writing um, and working together on a picture book. So we're the visual tellers and they're the word tellers. And I think like we work together to, to make it work. And unless you are the writer illustrator into one person, but also like Paddy was saying that um, they work as an introduction say to reading, but they are also the first contact that children have with art. So unless they go into an art gallery the, the it's very likely you know that the first time they're going to see pictures made by real life artists is through a picture book and uh, and this is our chance of you know showing the wide range of possibilities that there are you know for expressing yourself and seeing the world and understanding who we are and kind of going you know colors and textures and universes it's it's pretty fantastic you know there's uh, with all the respect with the tech side, there is no app that can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Patty? There's yeah, no yeah. app. <laughs> um, no, I mean, because you see... No, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's a shared ex reading experience that you're having with a grown-up, you know? Mm -hmm. So the child sits with you when you have that love... Like, you can read a picture book to a baby and, you know, and have that lovely moment of shared experience of, mm -hmm. you know, you know, they're growing and developing and looking. And like Una has said, the first thing they read are the pictures. Mm -hmm. They they read the expressions, the colors, the movements, you know. So to them, like kids are great at spotting things that grown-ups will just flip through and not bat an eyelid. It's funny you say that because I think when you were talking earlier, Patty, um, uh, just something popped into my head when I was a kid um, reading picture books myself or having them read to me I loved the books where there was something else going on in the picture that the text never referred to so like I, this I don't know why but something like that it, there's something going on in the house and that's the story and it's the mom is getting the kids to do something or whatever but all the time in the background there's a mouse trying to escape a cat you know something something like that because you're right I said the kids always notice that kind of stuff because yeah like you've all said and like una said to start us off on this point the picture tells the story so for the for the children especially if they're not reading it the picture is all they have the art is all they have so they're looking at that and they're drinking in every little detail every little brush stroke unknowingly and like you said Isla, not knowing that it's art but still getting that experience of getting to really examine art like that um so seeing as I mentioned the books I kind of liked, um, when you were all growing up, were there any particular picture books or not even growing up, just even, you know, it, when you, like Patty, when you were buying books to get to know the, the industry a bit, were there any big picture books that really stuck with you? And I'm not asking, what's your favorite one? I'm asking, what are the ones that, mm -hmm. oh, wow, that's, 
whatever. Um, Una, but do, do you want to start us off on that, maybe? Um, well, one of the picture books I love is Where the Wild Things Are, by Morris Sendak. I just love the little kid just being sent to his room and then just turns into a big adventure. And I just think it's such a great, simple story. But I just love that book. And I love the illustrations as well. <laughs> I, I No, I, I'm right there with you. I actually only recently um, got my, my boyfriend's nephew that for his birthday. And he, he because he is Max in that book. <laughs> like he is that kid. And so I was like, here's you in a book from the 60s. <laughs> but yeah, um, Tricella, what about you? What's one of the books that really stuck with you? Well, I mean, growing up, there is a Brazilian uh, children's book author. His name is Ziraldo. So that's Z-I-R-A-L-D-O. Sorry, I'm very bad at spelling in English. Uh, but um, he does fantastic. So he was around, he is still around, sorry, he's alive. He's a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, artist. But he did a lot of graphic stuff. And uh, there is a particular book called Flick which would be sort of the name of the color, like an, it's an ochre sort of the color, but it's basically just Pantone line shapes. And it's the story about how this color felt so lonely, you know, because all the other colors like would bring joy or peace or whatnot. And it just felt super sad. And it turns out that's the color of the moon. So it's like, and it's just graphic. Like there is, it's very simple, but beautifully like deceivingly simple beautifully executed so that was one of that impacted me and now to make more of a reference that people would know <laughs> um the giving tree uh oh. it's, it's a beautiful dual tonal uh story very heartbreaking also very deceivingly simple and i read that in portuguese but obviously in english yeah, it's, it's yeah it's it's known worldwide i'm sure yeah. um paddy what about yourself any books yeah, you? yeah uh what one i have which I, I got recently one i had when i was a kid was this one which you can see um but if you're on audio it's called uh, full moon soup by alistair graham and it's this big book where uh, it's based in a hotel and there's there are all these different rooms and uh in the basement or in the kitchen there's a chef making some strange soup and it's a full moon and then everything starts to, so there's no words in it. Um, so I think this is uh, like, like Connor was saying about um, there are just so much going on in, in the details. So this tells like, you know, 50 different stories and everything starts to go wrong. And there's, there's, I think there are aliens show up and, and uh, you know, werewolves and all sorts of things, but there's so much to follow in, um, in, in the spread. So it just changes. It's the same setting. And you just keep going through and there's just so much going on. Everything's interlinked with each other. And um, so it, it was one I, I definitely, uh, it had a big impact and, and uh, I really loved just pouring through all the details. And so I really, <clears throat> that's really had a big uh, influence on me whenever I create um, my, my illustrations now. Uh, and I try and fit in lots of little subplots like you were mentioning and lots of little um uh, details and and other things that are just you know my uh just in my imagination and just little things going on and little animals doing things and just try and fit all of that in because whenever the child is reading it uh, although as as Tarsila was saying like the parent is reading the the words and the kids are just engrossed in the images that's kind of what where it happens what's with the situation um they um they're gonna be looking for all those other little things happening and whenever they notice something i remember whenever i, I was you know reading picture books i always thought that i was the only person that noticed you know that thing going on in the corner and that little detail and like oh everybody else will have missed this you know so so i really love slipping those in so that book in particular um uh stood out to me as one that um that i really like growing up and then kind of more um modern picture books um i really liked um the immortal jellyfish um by sang miao um uh, so it's um it's a really beautiful one i really love the the illustration style uh in here and i i think i go for a lot of um uh I, I, the the picture books i really like the most are maybe um uh by illustrators that that are com in completely different styles 
Um, there's a there's a, a couple here uh, um, of uh, they they make picture books called uh, they're called Jacques and Lisa, and they they're here in Belgium and they make really beautiful um, picture books, um, which are really a completely different style to to the the kind of thing um, I do, but I really love you know getting inspired by by stuff that's different so I, I tend to fill my bookshelves with with stuff that that is completely different to the type of thing i do um but, but yeah that's good because then you're 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 ex you're exploring and you're you're seeing different things and everything um for sure and yeah. that's that's maybe you know something like if, if we're we're trying to think about um when you're starting out as an illustrator or you want to get into the industry um yeah you just have to expose yourself to tons of picture books and and you know it doesn't have to cost a fortune you can go to the library and just you know look at tons and tons of picture books and see what other people are doing mm -hmm. and there's just an endless uh, you know array of styles and um and it's not that you have to go and find someone to to copy and say okay i want to do it in this style it's more just try and figure out how other people are telling stories or like, you know, what, what are the tricks they use in their images or what methods they use to, to, to tell their story. Do they have tons of detail? Do they have, do the words and images just totally unrelated? Um, they're not related at all and they're telling different stories. Um, you know, look at the color palettes they use and, and you can look and see it's not so much that you have to look at, you know, trends in picture books and see there's lots of unicorn books or, or dragon books or panda books or anything. Um, and, and don't view that as something to go for. Um, but just kind of look and see what, what books are successful and try and figure out kind of why. And just kind of seeing that there are a million different styles out there mm -hmm. that should show you that, you know, you can, um, you can definitely have something uh, unique of your own. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's good to just kind of expose yourself to tons and tons of to, of inspiration. Yeah. I'm I'm very surprised none of you mentioned Dr. Seuss, um, <laughs> which is, I think for people of of um, kind of our age groups in general, uh, it, it's it's especially in Ireland, which is something I only learned recently. Dr. Seuss was was always bigger in Ireland before it moved to the UK and the rest of Europe for some reason. So I think yeah. it just I think it just travels um, wet west. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> east. I think it just traveled east <laughs> gradually and just stopped in Ireland on the way. But um, like the cat in the hat is one of my, even from when I was a kid, I actually found, because I, I was born in the States and um, <clears throat> neighbors gave my mom and my dad loads of their kids old books. And like their kids were like in their late teens when I was born. So I got all their books and I, I have like a cat in the hat that was printed in the 70s. And it, it's it's so raggedy and the spine mm -hmm. is just barely hanging on by a thread because I read it so much as a kid. But that's the thing about picture books. When a kid finds a picture book that they love, they love it so much and it becomes like, like so integrated into them as a person. Like even Patty, you were saying that book influenced you as an illustrator. And I mean, Una, you mentioned where the wild things are, which is such a huge classic internationally. You know, these, the, these books, I feel more than most kids books can have such a lasting impact uh, on children. You know, I think that's something that's so exciting about them. Um, I do want to start asking now about the actual process of making the picture book and everything. So Tarsila, I might just ask you this question and then I'll ask everyone else different questions. Um, okay. What is the process then for, for you in particular? Now, obviously every author and every illustrator is going to be completely different, but mm -hmm you've illustrated other people's books before writing your own. So, so what's the process for you? Do you get the full text first or do you kind of get a summary or like, what's it like when the publisher comes to you and says, here's the book we want you to illustrate. What happens first? Okay. So uh, most of my books are in Irish and because I was born in Brazil, let's say that Irish is not my first or my second language. Um, and <laughs> so, so I have been learning and uh, I can speak a little bit. I can understand quite a lot uh, now. But when, but when I started, uh, not really. So, um, but usually would come, the story would come to me and sort of already distributed into how they would fall onto the page mostly. Just because um, with a picture book, usually the format of a picture book, and this is sort of, 
standard. That's counting the cover and the back cover. Now that can vary depending on the kind of book. You know, if the board book is shorter, if it's a more say nonfiction book, it could be longer. So it really depends. But 32 tends to be the standard. And the reason for that is actually just because of the way it's printed. So they print a huge page, fold it a few times, and it creates a section that has 16 pages and then two sections turned into the 32. So that's basically why it's 32. Um, but also because 32 pages is a good time span for the age between say zero to eight, five to eight to kind of sit down and have a read uh, and also in which you can tell a story. So in a way, a picture book is a very technical book to make and probably uh, Paddy and Una can uh, confirm that. Uh, so within those constraints, we can develop. So usually comes, the story comes sort of pre-divided and obviously then can be inter iterations for you know the text once the images are in, but the images don't get just, oh, that's it, that's done, that's something, whatnot. You know? So you first develop the character or characters that are gonna be in the story, at least for me. And then once I get those characters, like I get to know them, not just through the story, but how do they look? You know, how do, how, how does their um, body posture represent who they are within the story? What are the details on their clothes that tell the story as well? You know, what kind of characters they are? What kind of expressions do they have? What kind of things do they do? So I get to know who these main or main characters are through drawing a bazillion times of them and maybe different types of characters. It's sort of like you're, you're the director of a movie and you're casting your cast. So you're like, you're okay. choosing who's gonna play into your place. So if you were kids that used to like make plays with your friends, that's your chance of like setting your character. So you choose who you want to play your character, how they're gonna look, what they're gonna wear. So you're in charge of the light and the setting and the clothes, everything. It's actually lots of fun. Sorry, I get very excited. <laughs> so, um, so I developed the characters and then I developed the setting. Where is the story going to take place? So say for one of my first books, um, Nagara Skull. So I developed the characters first and I knew it's going to be a bear. Uh, that much I knew, uh, but then that was it. So um, there's actually a role reversal. So you see that the little kid is actually dressed up very much in a grown up way. He has like a bow tie, the glass is very serious and tidy and mom sort of like with a loose sort of childish dress. So there is within the story, you know, which is like, don't go to school because she doesn't want, she's the one who's afraid of going to school. So um, that's where- Being I'm a primary teacher and uh, school just started, you do see those parents who are just like, no, please don't go up. So yeah, you, you have that down, right? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, Mara really captured that, you know, story. But then again, how could I reflect that sentiment? uh within the visual so how can the children you know also read visually that idea and then also say the settings so there will be a little bit of a school a little bit of the house so how can the house be like appealing to to say if it's going to be translated into multiple languages then it needs to be a house that is not like a typical irish home or a typical brazilian home so kind of making it general generic enough that people will recognize it is a house but distinctive enough that it belongs within that universe so you have to find a little bit of a balance like i remember it's we had a talk like, about light switching the whole thing is a balancing <laughs> act though like i mean you have it to is. the color scheme the, the the character's posture like so that's the general thing you get the gist of the story first you start experimenting and it seems like you more you start way out here and you just refine down until you get the right pictures yeah yeah and then you develop say the thumbnails which are like squiggles to kind of say how the story is going to flow when there's more tension when there is less tension and then of course like you said you can play with colors to convey ideas as well as moves and all that and then those get developed into say clean sketches and then those get adjusted. And then once the picture sort of gets sorted, it kind of goes back to the author and I don't speak to the author, okay? So the, the publisher does. So there is no communication because sometimes authors can have a very strict view of what they believe the story is. Mm. Uh, but what the illustrator wants is that once that story goes back to the author that they go, this is better than what I imagined because it's our our job to kind of 
make the story be elevated and kind of have a different twist than Wash was. Not saying that they don't have great ideas. It's just you want to make it be the best that it can be. Well, I suppose that's the thing. You guys are as illustrators. I know. I know we have two author illustrators. You're all author illustrators, but speaking as just illustrators, you are an artist as well, and you're creative as well, and you have to have your own spin and your own take on the text that the author provides. So it's important that there is that kind of a, a to and a fro. Um, but uh, Una, I'm going to ask you the, the next question, if that's okay. You also wrote um, a book, a picture book as well. So, so for you, when you were um, creating, um, have you seen the Dublin Vampire? Like what came first for you? Was it the illustration or the text? Did you focus on one first to, and then work on the other or was it in tandem? Like how, how did that work for you? Well, first came with the character. I always draw loads of different characters and I love drawing kind of spooky characters and stuff. And then when I come up with the character, I always have to kind of visualize what the story is going to be. So I like to see kind of different things in the story. I would draw some maybe locations or other characters. And then once I've kind of a few sketches done, then I'll kind of start doing a bit of writing. And then I'll, it's kind of a mix of the two. I'll do some thumbnails and I'll write a bit. So I kind of combine the two and kind of, nearly like a jigsaw kind of put it together mm. like that because I, I kind of I have to kind of see that it's going to work if I write something I kind of would be thinking about the pictures at the same time <laughs> that must so, be frustrating though because <laughs> you, you kind of have to you're double jobbing and you're you're trying to think of of both um and also one thing came to mind there do you ever get a mo- did you ever get a moment uh, where you might have writer's block so you say, oh, I'll leave the text for a minute and I'll focus on the illustrations or vice versa. Yes. And sometimes I kind of find that helps if or if I'm kind of stuck, even with the illustrations, I'll kind of write a bit more and I'll come up with more ideas that way. So I kind of like combining two. I always like to kind of visualize. So I think that's why I have to kind of do a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, I'm going to ask you this question here because you, you were the first one to mention it just before I forget to ask. For those who don't know, could you just explain maybe what a dummy book is just in the context of, of picture books and everything? Well, a dummy book would be a very rough kind of layout of how the book will flow. So you'll have your text and some kind of rough illustrations, but it'll all be kind of put together as a book so that you can turn the pages and see how the story works. So that's kind of what a dummy book is. So it'd be like a 32 page, very rough version of the book. Good, good. Because I think I think it's so easy when you know the 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 industry lingo to just throw it out there and, and then <laughs> and then people are like, what did they mean by that? <laughs> yeah, the sketches can be really rough. You can kind of see just how the page turns work and if the story is gonna flow. Perfect. I think that page turns and, and the flow, that's so important in a picture book. I think more than any other book, because um, when a book is text heavy, you know, you can, if the page ends on a sentence, it's fine. It's normal. But with a picture book, you want to tempt the reader to the end of the book, don't you? You have to get yeah. them to go there. Um, so you, you create that through, it's, it's what we call page turnability. So yeah. say, like, like you said, you leave the cliffhanger on a, on a book that is like word filled. Mm-hmm. On you, you end your chapter, so it doesn't matter. You end the chapter and you move the setting. That's what you do. You leave people on a cliffhanger. And what you do on a picture book is, on your right page, you always leave them hanging there <laughs> because you want. It's true because then no, once know. you turn the page and that's your page turn ability, that's where you go, bang. <laughs> uh, as somebody who who writes thrillers, um, my right page is the end of the chapter, uh, so that you can. So they're like, oh, I need to know. <laughs> Um, Paddy, I'm going to ask you the next question. Um, as as an illustrator, when when the picture text comes to you from an author, like what are the things that to you makes a great picture text, picture book text? Like what are the things that are like, oh wow, yeah, that I can't wait to draw this thing. Like what are the things that pop out to you? Uh, yeah, it, it it is exactly that. Like once you start reading it, um, you start to already imagine what it could look like i think that's the that's when you know it's a really good one or the the ones i've most enjoyed working on i remember you know getting them to, for the first time and, and reading it and then thinking oh that would be really cool to illustrate or that would be 
that would be great. And there are certain things I really like to illustrate a lot more than than others. And um, and it works the other way too. Like I, I did um, I did a picture book called Here Be Dragons, and it's got a horse in every page. And horses are really notoriously hard to draw, and illustrators hate them. Um, so that was like, oh no, I'm gonna have to draw a horse on every page. And um, but also it's it was a, an amazingly fun story. So it's uh, it, it, it was really worth. But, but yeah you get uh you get the, the text in and then you start if it's a good one you'll already start to imagine all the fun stuff um you're going to draw and sometimes i've gotten the text and it does have you know illustration notes in it and i i much prefer not having any notes in it um because it's really hard to unsee you know. the, the ideas like once you've seen kind of what the author had in mind it's really hard to think of something completely different so it's a lot more challenging so it's it's much better to I find it's much better to just have the text and then you can kind of just go, go wild with it. And even, you know, sometimes you just get the text and it's not done page by page and you can just kind of imagine it. I think in a lot of the um, books I've worked on, we, we have rearranged some stuff or, or we've kind of, uh, it's not that we, that I uh, would, would try to get the author to rewrite anything, but sometimes I can think of a really cool visual that as Tarsila was saying, okay, that would work really well if we turned the page and then hit them with a really great visual. But then, you know, we don't need this line anymore or I can tell something rather than, or I can show something rather than it being told in the text or maybe we have to move the text to the next page or whatever. But I don't really kind of, um, you know, mess with the author's text uh, too much. Um, so that's kind of uh, uh, how it works for me. And it's um, it's really different to, so I've, I've also done, um, my own stories that uh, author illustrated and that's a really different process um and i think if you talk to like 10 illustrators they'll all tell you they work in a really different that's, way that's so, the next so thing that's to say i yeah, have three that's, author illustrators here and that's three completely different ways of doing things so if you're listening and you know every like these guys are artists you know it's it's everyone has a completely different way of doing it and that's okay and yeah so, encouraged <laughs> Yeah, if you're starting out uh, and, you, you know, you try and research as much and read as many blogs and listen to interviews like this and everything. Um, and sometimes it can feel you're trying to find the, what the right way is to do something. But, you know, everybody's, uh, we're all just making it up as we go along. So there's no, uh, there's no right way of doing it and everybody works in it. So you just have to figure out what, what works for you. And each time I work on a project, my process changes a little bit anyway. But when I'm working on my own stories... Um, usually it starts with the idea um, and I have a rough idea of, or, or just kind of some element in the story which I think is interesting and then I would jump into so I'm really you know technical about it coming from a tech background I know like as Tarsila said there's 32 pages to work with so I know okay I have to get from the beginning to the end and have a couple of twists and turns in there and I have to do it in so many pages and I have to think about turning the page. So I usually have a rough idea of, okay, that's a big element. That's another big element. That's another big element. And I have all those placeholders in there. And then I try and think about, you know, things I would like to illustrate. So things I, I tend to, you know, want to create a book that, that um, you know, has no horses in it. Or I really like uh, illustrating, <laughs> you know, the sea or, or you know, uh, islands and jungles and lots of different things. That, that appeal to me. So I try and, you know, squeeze those in if that's what the, the idea is. And so I have this really rough, um, uh, you know, kind of visual dummy book, I guess. But I mean, there's no story there that, or there's a story there, but there's no, no words there. Mm. Um, and then I would sit down, once I have that, then I sit down with, you know, uh, a Word document and start um, trying to add some text in there. And I've got, I guess, some rough characters in there. So I Maybe I've sketched those out, so I have to try and figure out what their voice sounds like, and um, and then I would so I would go through and write a bunch of a bunch of text, which probably sounds awful. And then I would once I've got that, I usually have you know killed a few of my pages because of what I've written, and it's changed uh, direction. So then I would go back and change the sketches, and it's just a back and forth process. I was going to say you're um, just going back between being the yeah. author, being the illustrator until the book meets in the middle really yeah so that's kind of how it go and even um on my author illustrated uh, books even like right up until the end when you're finishing the last illustrations i'm still 
tinkering with the text and moving things around and, and removing words and um, all of that. So it's, you have a lot more creative flexibility there. Um, whereas if I'm working on another author's um, uh, book, if I'm illustrating for another author's story, which I also really love to do, um, I really respect their words um, a lot in that and don't want to mess around with it. It's only if we have a really good idea that kind of to, to kind of nudge things maybe, but I wouldn't be like, okay, let's change this, change that, change that. So um, it's a really different process because in that scenario, the words have probably already gone through tons of iterations with an editor and everything. So it's kind of set in stone. So I'm, as Tarsila said, you're kind of elevating it then and you're adding an, an extra layer to it. So it's a, it's a kind of one, two process. Whereas working on my own stuff, it's really back and forth and messy and yeah. all over the place. Yeah. So the one, number one thing I'm taking from that though, as a man who has written the text of a picture book and would like to publish it one day, um, don't write a picture book about horses. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also um, from, from the work that I have done with lots of different uh, authors is the one thing that I always hear them saying as well is the whole thing of uh, either in text or in image is show, don't tell. Oh, absolutely. So it's, so it's a lot about the experience. So don't say such and such sat down such and such is sitting down you know you don't have to say he jumped with joy you can totally through do that with you know because it's a very easy coming from an adult mind and reading lots of books who are very descriptive to make assumptions that you have to convey emotions movement and ideas through the words and sometimes those get tap 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 um, and it's actually very common that once the images go back and that's why i think editors speak to the authors is it's not the illustration but the illustrator butchering your your words it's really now that the words are saying that your character is sitting down you don't have to have it in the text so you know and the child will know and the <laughs> parent will know everybody will look because you read the image in seconds so yeah. um yeah so show don't tell perfect that's a really important tip no matter what type of author or history, <laughs> show, don't tell. It's, it cannot put enough. And sometimes it's really hard to understand it. But when you read a book that tells instead of shows, you can tell. Ah, look what I did there with my words. Um, so, Una, I'd like to ask you now, could you tell us a little bit about your inspiration behind um, Have You Seen the Dublin Vampire and what a spooktacular place to be? Uh, I know you said you really like spooky things and stuff, but uh, which I think we're kindred spirits. Um, Halloween's better than Christmas. But <laughs> what, what is it for you? That, what, what was it that sparked those ideas? Well, first I came up with the character, the vampire, and I really wanted to have him in a story. And I actually grew up down the road um, from Marino Crescent, and um, that's where Bram Stoker was born. Yeah. So I always kind of had a fascination about vampires and Dracula. So I kind of thought it'd be nice to do a story where the vampire was still in the Merino Crescent and that he was there, but nobody kind of knew that he was there. And then a little kid kind of spots him. So that was kind of the kind of the idea behind the first book. And then people really liked the character. So I thought it'd be great to do another kind of spooky book because I love drawing spooky things. <laughs> so one day um, the vampire wakes up and he kind of looks around at his creepy tree and he kind of wonders maybe there's somewhere more spectacular than this creepy tree so he decides to go on a ghost bus tour kind of around Ireland looking for the most spectacular place to be so I, I had loads of really good fun drawing kind of really spooky characters well, like spooky characters that I could add in and spooky places so it was good fun <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent um, I, I that's yeah Bram Stoker, I don't think enough people know. He's Irish. I don't care. <laughs> like, we made up the best horror book ever. <laughs> no, I was always kind of really curious because his house is down there and I was kind of going, like, I wonder, like, where he came up with the idea and it'd be great, like, if the vampire really was still there. So. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's the vampire from your book and not the vampire yeah. from Bram Stoker's <laughs> book. I um, Teresa and Paddy, I'm going to ask you to talk about your books, but I'm going to edit this bit out. Um, we're getting tight for time, so <laughs> so definitely do. I'm going to ask you, and don't rush yourselves, but I'm just we're going to 
because the episodes have to be 45 minutes or less and uh, <laughs> we've already recorded 55 <laughs> 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 that's a lot of editing on me so um just give me a sec for a bit of silence and then i'll ask you Teresa. that um actually before i ask you Teresa, what's the name the just remind me the names of your books because i didn't have it written down it's um so um, this one it's yeah it's i co-authored it with julia someone that says she's a french uh, author so my little album of dublin and then my little album of ireland perfect okay and Tarsilla, could you tell us a bit about your little albums? You have a little album of Dublin and a little album of Ireland. That's actually kind of hard to say quickly. <laughs> There's a lot of vowels. <laughs> little album of Ireland. Tell us about the ideas behind those books. Okay, so this is a book that I co-authored with a French author called Julia Samonde. And it's basically a node to the capital city of Ireland. And it's because obviously both of us aren't from here, but we've made our homes here. So it's a bit of our, our love letter to the, to the city. And um, it's not a picture book in a traditional way. It's a nonfiction. So it's loads of uh, simple search and find uh, spots. And then you have all these different items that are um, written in um, in English and Oswald. So you get a bit of the language flavor there, but you also get a bit of a taste of the capital city and you can find and learn a bit of Irish. And then we decided that, you know, Dublin is lovely, but we want to extend our love throughout the the, the island so Dublin's we lovely, went but all over it's small and there's a whole island there and that's what I always say to when when I when I have friends coming over from like America or something I was like oh we're gonna go to Ireland it's like great what are you doing we're spending a week in Dublin I'm like oh so you're going to Dublin <laughs> yeah so you just yeah, and also everything. yeah and also with the work that you do as a, a as a um, as a published author illustrator, you get to do lots of events with kids. And I got to travel all over the country, visiting libraries and schools. And I got to see all these like wonderful places. So we have a new book coming out uh, at the end of this year. That is a little album of Ireland with lots of new places. And like Paddy and yourself noted that, you know, you throw in a few bits. So there are a few um, known characters. Uh, Bram Stoker is there too. Uh, the actual Bram Stoker, not the vampire. Uh, and um, I do that. a couple of cameos of um, books. There might be a vampire in my book. Uh, and uh, there are also like a few um, Irish known people around. So it's nice to keep an eye out for uh, whoever's going to be there. Maybe you can find yourself there, Connor. I highly doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> for most people they're gonna be like who's this kind of guy and why is he involved in wonderfest uh, <laughs> so, you'll never know you'll never uh, know uh patty uh can you tell us a little bit about uh the vanishing lake and um, particularly tell us a little bit about it being uh published in chinese which is oh yeah um far away yeah. language for it to be done from for you know it's um so so yeah my um I, i've been lucky enough to have uh four books out this year um that i worked on um, what well, one was Here Be Dragons, um, written by Susanna Lloyd, uh, and I did the illustrations. It came out in February. Um, and then I had uh, Home, which was written by Jean Willis, um, and it came out in, in March. And then in April, um, my, my author illustrated book, um, uh, The Vanishing Lake, came out. And um, yeah, it was, uh, so it came out in English in April, but uh, late last year it came out uh, first in Chinese. So the publisher is a, a, um, based in China and, and the States. Um, so they had planned on bringing it out in, in uh, English in, in the States and also in China, uh, which is really exciting. And, um, but uh, due to the pandemic and everything, the, the English version was a, came out a little bit later. Uh, and I think that's kind of also, I think that happened on one or two of my other books. So everything came out at once this year. So uh, it seemed like everything um, happened all at the same time. But yeah, The Vanishing Lake then was my uh, alter, illustrated debut. So my first one that I, that I wrote and illustrated. And it's based on a real uh, lake up in, in County Antrim, where I'm from, um, uh, which disappears and reappears all of the time, which... Um, when you're growing up beside it, it seems completely normal and you don't really think about it twice. But after moving away and living abroad for years um, and then you tell people about it, um, that, that seems kind of, um, yeah, it's something very unusual and also kind of interesting. I thought it was kind of mysterious. And whenever I was coming up with a bunch of 
picture book ideas. So I, I started off illustrating other people's stories and then I wanted to see if I could do my own. And I, I, um, that was one of the ideas. I think just the, the, the title, um, the vanishing lake just kind of, uh, was interesting, intriguing enough. And then I, um, I, I, yeah, tried to find a story that was, um, based around the mystery of it. So I had, as in most, um, picture books, um, or most children's books, you need a central character who is, who the child can see themselves, put themselves in their shoes. So I had a child character who visits her granddad who lives by this lake, which disappears and reappears. And, um, she's very much set in the real world and wants to know the scientific reason. And her grandfather tells her all these wild stories about giants and mermaids and everything. And she doesn't believe any of them. Um, so she's kind of, uh, yeah, reluctant to kind of open her imagination a little bit. And um, so, yeah, maybe at the end of it, you kind of find out the real or not so real answer to why it vanishes. Um, but we slipped in some sciencey stuff at the back um, as well. So people can read about the real lake. So, um, yeah, that was really, um, really great. And it um, it also uh, amazingly won. Uh, I was really surprised that it won a couple of awards. So it was named in, in, uh, in China. It was named in the uh, best children's books in china um uh, lists oh, wow. uh, they choose like 12 books every year and um, so it, it was in that um and then it won the uh, gold medal for uh, the picture book category and the independent publisher book awards um so so that was really um kind of unbelievable that um uh, that that happened um but yeah, it's always been pretty amazing that I hear it. It's going down really well in in China, so that that's kind of uh, amazing. And it's amazing to get um, to see your book in other languages. I've been lucky enough to work on some books now that have been that have had co editions and getting to see kind of the different uh, the different text integrated into your images is is um, always a treat. Um, and yeah, I have one last book which um, is published on the twenty third of September. Um, which is called The Last Seaweed Pie. Um, and um, I just actually got a copy um, myself um, uh, there now. And it's about these two um, groups of creatures. Um, you have the treeple that live on the, uh, on the lands. They live in the trees. And then you have the seeple, which live in the ocean. And the treeple are all about building things and um, not aren't so conscious about kind of what they do with all the rubbish and it all ends up in the sea. And then there's kind of, uh, how they, how they're going to, how the sequel kind of, um, how, how, how they all kind of figure out what, uh, what to do. So there's like a big, um, you know, conservation message, environment message in there. Um, and yeah, so that was really fun because and like all four of these books all have a lot of landscapes and, and, um, there's a lot of water in all of them and um yeah it has a lot of the stuff like really textured stuff that i really love to work on so that all of them kind of share um that same uh, they're all in that same area so it was really um yeah i've been really lucky this year to have to have those ones out so um it's lots of fun yeah uh, i mean i remember now back to my first like kind of 2017 um and then i got my first book projects in 2018 but I mean, nothing was coming out until I think my first book started coming out in 2019. So, I mean, there's like two years of nothing being out there, um, which is really, you know, it's frustrating. And, and, and uh, yeah, you, you kind of wonder if you're in the right uh, industry or, or if it's, uh, yeah, if you're, if you've got the kind of, if it, you're made for it. And, um, but then after a while, then the books start coming out and then, as you're growing as an illustrator and author and you're doing more and more and um yeah that starts yeah sometimes lots of stuff is coming out at once so then it's really yeah. i mean that's the the best well one of the best parts is whenever they you get to see them in bookshops and you get to uh you know read them to kids or, or kids come up to you and you get to sign up your books or you hear feedback from parents um so those are all really amazing um parts of the process but it does take a while to get to that stage but it's like anything you have to you know persevere and uh, and keep trying at it and then you know you eventually get to that that really fun part where where all the books are on bookshelves thank you so much paddy thank you so much Tristan. thank you so much una i'm gonna ask you all one question and i just want a yes or a no out of it just for fun before we say goodbye 
uh, one of my favourite authors, not a children's author, well, he, he has written children's book as well, is uh, Neil Gaiman. And Neil Gaiman does this thing where he'll go into a bookshop and if nobody recognises him, he'll wander. And if he can find his books, he'll open and sign them and put them back on the shelf without telling anybody. So I just want to know, have any of you ever done that? <laughs> Not secretly, um, but I, I've been into a few uh, bookshops. Yeah, uh, recently I, I got to I got to go back to Ireland, which is the first time uh, since the pandemic. So, and and a lot of my books have come out kind of during the pandemic. So it was great to meet with some bookshops and uh, meet with some people who I've talked online with and, and never met in person. And it was really fun to go in and and to see some copies on actual bookshelves. So most of my books uh, aren't out in Belgium. So um, it, it was great to go in and actually see them on shelves. And then, yeah, I got to I got to sign a bunch, which is um, which is really fun. Yeah, but no, I, I've never done it secretly. But uh, try it; it's supposed to be great fun. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Uh, Tarsella, what about you? Have you ever snuck in a signature just for? Uh- uh, not secretly as well, but I have, I, I think like uh, sometimes I need like external validation. So I just go in and say, I see you're talking my books. Would you like me to sign some? And I think I'm cheeky enough to do it. Um, I actually, and one of the funny things is, do you know, like sometimes you go into shops and they have a sticker that says signed by the author. Yeah. Right. Uh, because I make picture books and I illustrate them. There is no such a sticker for signed by the illustrator. Right. Fine. So. I've made some. (laughs) Yeah, so I go in and I am that cheeky. So I go in and I say, I do have some of my books. Like, oh, really? Uh, And sorry, my dog is crying. Um, And then (laughs) um, I sign the book and then I put the little sticker on it that says signed by the illustrator. It has a little pencil on it. Uh, Because if you actually talk to illustrators, You'll understand that a lot of the times we're not listed on, say, the, 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 the bookshops. You might go in and look for my name and not find my books because I might be lost. listed under an illustrator and not as an author. So um, even if you look like Sarah McIntyre, she has this whole thing called the uh, Pictures Mean Business. And it's an initiative to help get illustrators more, especially for picture books, get it recognized and appreciated for the art. So that's kind of my sneaky way of doing it. So if you guys ever want some stickers, let me know. <laughs> that's such a good idea. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> what about you, Una? Have you ever? No, I've never done that. But once I was signing some books in a smaller Eason's and I did ask, but another member of staff didn't realize I was doing it and they came over. I think they thought I was just drawing on the books and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, oh no, I wrote the book. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know whether I'd even chance not asking. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we all have to wait until you're, you're, we're all huge names, international names like Neil Gaiman, because then you can get away with it. <laughs> well, I think they just thought I was drawing on the books. <laughs> like, so we need to like, like, have a little. As well. <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do we we should all carry like cards, like a professional illustrator, <laughs> author. You know, you go in. <laughs> I mean, it's it's lovely. Obviously, we're not recognized to the point of being new, you know, but, you know, we, we do our best with what we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Patty, Tarsilla and Una, thank you all so much for coming on to the show and uh, telling us all about picture books and everything. And uh, it's been great to get to know you all. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry, my Bye. dog is like completely whiny. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks once again to Una, Paddy and Tarsilla for their amazing insights, advice and more. Make sure you check out the episode description for links to their websites, books and social media. For me, the one takeaway I get from talking to Una and Paddy and Tarsilla was just how much the illustrations and text must support and elevate each other in order to make the book truly memorable. Oftentimes as a teacher, I'm kind of tempted to focus on the text um, to teach a particular point or um, rhyming or something like that or I might focus on the pictures instead to inspire an art lesson but really for a good picture book they need to be kind of one and the same and really support each other to make the book even better. Don't forget about the events I mentioned at the start of the episode if you're interested in being a picture book maker whether that be through writing or illustrating. So we have a masterclass on illustrating children's books with Margaret and Suggs, as well as another masterclass on writing and illustrating together um, with Mary Murphy. And then finally, the webinar that's being hosted by um, 
are chaired by Margaret Ann Suggs with guests Ashman Chaco, Tercilla Cruz and Emma Byrne. If you, wind out, if you want to find out more about anything Wonderfest, be sure to check our website. You can find the links in the episode description for all things Wonderfest. And finally, next week. So uh, be sure to tune in because I'll be talking to Shane Hegarty, Swap Mahado and Sheena Dempsey all about chapter books. What exactly are they? Who are they for? What type of stories make great chapter books? All that kind of thing. Be sure to check it out next week and uh, have a fanta- fantastic time and I'll see you then. By the way, yes, I am really going to try and get a whale pun in in every single episode. Uh, it, it, it might be a struggle. I'm already running out and it's only episode two, but, you know, wish me luck. <laughs> anyway, see you next week. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this as useful, as inspiring as I did. Don't forget that Wonderfest is happening from the 17th to the 21st of November 2021. Head over to wonderfest.ie to find out how else you can have a whale of a time. See you there!